My name is John Carr, and I'm director of the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life at Georgetown University. I want to welcome you to our online dialogue on what faith has to do about it, uh, a session with reporters on faith and the faithful in the 2020 presidential election. This is our 11th online dialogue uh, since the coronavirus shut down our in-person dialogues. And uh, it's been a tremendous opportunity to talk about how faith, how Catholic social thought, how uh, moral values and religious principles shape public life. We've reached over 45,000 people, and we're really glad that you're a part of this conversation. It will be recorded. You can share it with others. There is, uh, we've had cardinals, we've had uh, uh, somebody who works with domestic workers. We've had uh, uh, hotshot journalists like we do today. Uh, what we try and do is find the smartest people we can to talk about some of the most important questions facing our country, our church, and our culture. And today we're going to, we have uh, a wonderful researcher and four uh, respective reporters to focus on how religious values and voters are uh, being wooed in this election, uh, raised in this election, and how might they have some impact. Uh, there's a part of me that these times feel almost biblical. I mean, uh, we have a plague that is worldwide. The West Coast is on fire. The Southeast is facing a hurricane. Uh, terrible time of sadness and loss. There are people without work, uh, families without food. So I just want to pause for a minute and say a word of prayer for all those suffering. Lord, bless your people, bless your country. Give us faith, give us hope. Help us to care for one another. Help us to advance the common good. Watch over all those who are suffering. Amen. As I said, that's something we normally do, but it just feels like uh, we ought to ask the Lord to protect those who are in danger. Uh, this time, online session, we're going to ask uh, these reporters and uh, a leader of the Pew uh, group to help us think about what's going on around us. If you watch the conventions, in different ways, they lifted up uh, religious voters and values. Uh, the campaigns are doing so as well. So we thought we would begin with Elizabeth uh, Supiak. Supiak. Uh, she is one of the key research at the Pew Center and she works on their polling on domestic religious polls. She uh, has done a lot of work on Latinos and uh, religious uh, demographics. Uh, she worked on the religious landscape study. If you've not read that, Pew is really the go-to place uh, for information on this. Um, Elizabeth, can you tell us at the outset, and you know, you're an analyst and a researcher, not a reporter. So uh, let's begin with some facts. What do we know about the attitudes, trends, and choices of religious voters. How do they see President Trump and Vice President Biden? And if you can, tell us what's going on with some key groups, evangelicals, Catholics, uh, others. And if, if you can, what are factors that are moving religious voters? I want to thank you and your colleagues at Pew. So many people neglect uh, uh, religious factors in public life, and you help us think about them seriously. So. Give us a sense of what's going on. Thank you so much, John, for your kind words about our work, for your great introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to be able to kind of start this off with some of our more recent data. Um, I'm going to share a few slides that we have going to kind of look at how religious voters feel about the current candidates. Let me pull those up now. So. I want to start off with kind of a broad overview here to say that um, 
overall among registered voters, that's who we're looking at here, uh, 45% say that they would vote for Donald Trump if the election were held today, or that as of today, they lean towards supporting him. And 53% say the same about Joe Biden. But we also see that there are distinct religious breaks on this question, and those might not be too surprising for anybody who has been following these trends. So I just I do want to step back for a minute and note that these breaks are largely consistent with the exit poll data that we've seen over the past several presidential elections. And in terms of candidate preference here ahead of the 2020 election, we don't see too much change. We see that among white evangelical Protestant voters, the vast majority say that they would vote for Trump if the election were held today. At the other end of the spectrum, the vast majority of black Protestants, that 92% say that they would vote for Biden if the election were held today. You also see these familiar breaks among Catholics. About six in 10 white Catholic voters say they would vote for Trump and on the other end, 65% of Hispanic Catholics say that they would vote for Biden. One of these other questions that I find incredibly interesting, aside from just who religious voters, uh, who they prefer, is kind of what their vote means to them. And so this is from a different survey than the previous slide, but these data really show, they show a follow-up question to who people say they're supporting. Uh, for example, about two thirds of white evangelical Protestants say that they would vote for Trump and that their vote for him is a true vote for him as opposed to a vote against Biden, which is that 17% that you see in the first bar at the top there. But largely across most religious groups, um, voters are more likely, so the voters for Trump across most religious groups, voters are more likely to say that their vote is a vote for Trump than it is against Biden. You can see that with white Protestants who are not evangelical, 45% say their vote is a vote for Trump compared with that 16% who say their vote is against Joe Biden. But as you can see, just looking at this chart, that's not always the case for Biden supporters. So among black Protestant voters, to be sure, about half say that their vote for Biden is a true vote for him but still 37% say that their vote for him is a vote against Donald Trump. And among the religiously unaffiliated, another strongly democratic base, 54% say that their vote for Biden is a vote against Trump, while just 18% say their vote is a vote for Biden. And I will say that a lot of this fits with an open-ended question that was asked in the July poll, the one that we just talked about in the previous slide. So we asked supporters of each candidate what the main reason is in their own words that they support him. Among Trump supporters who are registered to vote, 19% overall say he is not Biden, uh, including 19% of white evangelical Protestant voters and 21% of Catholic voters who say this. Among Biden supporters who are registered to vote, 56% say the main reason is he is not Trump. And that includes 62% of religiously unaffiliated voters, 60% of white Protestants who are not evangelical, 46% of Catholics, and 42% of black Protestant voters. And so in kind of a different way of measuring this satisfaction, we asked, we asked people straight up how satisfied they are with these candidate choices. And so aside from people saying that their vote is for or against someone else, there are very few people relatively who say that they are very satisfied with the candidate choices that they are being offered in this 2020 election. So we can say about half of voters overall say that they are satisfied very or fairly, but just 21% say that they are very satisfied with these choices. And you can see through this chart that that level of very satisfied is not all that high across religious groups even among white evangelical Protestant voters who largely support Trump, as we've seen, just 32% say that they are very satisfied with the candidate choices. And at the other end of the spectrum, among religiously unaffiliated voters, just 9% say that they are very satisfied here. Before I turn this back over, I do wanna to touch on some of these issue priorities that we've thought so much about what matters to people when they're voting this November. 
Um, so we asked people, not in their own words, but gave them a list and asked them to say how important these issues are to their vote in November. And you can see, um, I know there's a lot on the slide and I'm happy to come back to it with any questions that pop up later, but what we're looking at is the percent of registered voters in each group who say that each of these issues on the left are very important to their vote in November. And so we see that there is overall a lot of consensus about the economy being very important, about Supreme Court appointments being very important, but we see a little more variation when it comes to other issues that have been in the news a lot recently. And as we've been talking about um, on the coronavirus outbreak, you see that 87% of black Protestant voters and 75% of Hispanic Catholic voters say that this issue is very important to their vote in November. 70% uh, of unaffiliated voters say the same thing. By comparison, just 39% of white evangelical Protestant voters say the same. Some of these other issues that you see kind of this variation on are racial and ethnic inequality, economic inequality. On both of those, you see that some of these minority religious groups, black Protestants, Hispanic Catholics, are more likely to say that these issues are very important to their vote in November. And then one of the last, one of the last ones that I'll call out um, is abortion. So we, this comes up in the conversation a lot as whether or not this is an important issue to religious voters. Uh, and it, I think it comes up nearly every election cycle. And what we see here is that among all registered voters, about 40% say that abortion, the issue of abortion is very important to their November vote. Um, but it's most important, at least here, to white evangelical Protestant voters, about 60, 61% say that it's very important compared to about four and 10 or fewer of other groups. So with that, I will turn this one off and I will turn it back to John. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Uh, let me turn to the panel of our reporters. We have, we have an all-star cast. Carl Cannon is the Washington Bureau Chief of Real Clear Politics. Kelsey Dallas is the National Religion Reporter for Deseret News. Jack Jenkins is a National uh, Reporter for Religion News Service. Eugene Scott is a political reporter for The Fix uh, at the Washington Post. I'll say more about them when I turn to each of them individually. Uh, my friend Ken Woodward says, this is all overrated, that religion's not that big a factor in elections. Uh, E.J. Dion has been on our panels. He says there is no Catholic vote, but it's really important. I couldn't help noticing if you add white and Latino Catholics together, Biden leads 51 to 47 percent. And I think in 11 out of the last 12 elections, uh, Catholics have voted for the next president. Uh, others say this is terribly neglected, that the polls don't cover it. The analysis is superficial and shallow. We want to cut through that dichotomy and get people who cover this, who understand it, both the, the way in which religion shapes the campaign and the way in which it doesn't. So let me ask a very general opening question. After the conventions, and now that we're in the campaigns, both of which are focusing on this in surprising ways, how are religious factors shaping the campaign and how might voters who take religion seriously impact the outcome? Let's just go in alphabetical order. Let's start with Carl. Thank you, John, for, for hosting this. Religi the religious, people's religious views are very important in how they vote, um, as Liz Elizabeth Charts point out, and both campaigns know it. Um, Joe Biden is running, he's be the fourth, he'd be the, he's the fourth nominee who's Roman Catholic of a major party, all Democrats, Al Smith in 1928, John F. Kennedy in 1960, John Kerry in 2004. And, he, and only Kennedy won, and he did so with a huge percentage of the Catholic vote. Um, Biden wants to win the Catholic vote. And you and I both know and love E.J. Dionne, but uh, the Catholic vote is, you know, it, one way to say it's the American electorate. It's so broad and so there's so many voters. But the other way to look at it is what, is what uh, you and Elizabeth pointed out, you can't lose the Catholic vote and win. 
It's like a Republican can't lose Ohio and win. So, you know, they both want the vote. Biden is sort of naturally, he doesn't have to do much to remind people he's Catholic. He is Catholic. He, he crosses himself. He's, he makes these illusions, uh, that are religious illusions. And, and Donald Trump wants to say, oh, but he's not really a Christian. Um, now, coming from Donald Trump, that maybe we can get in that a little later because Donald Trump is unchurched in a very, in very literal ways. Um, the funniest, one of the few humorous moments of the 2016 campaign came from Ted Cruz in Congressly, perhaps, but when Donald Trump talked about two Corinthians, um, uh, when he was talking about Second Corinthians, um, somebody asked, one of our reporters asked uh, Cruz about it in Iowa. He said, yeah, it's like that uh, old joke, two Corinthians walk into a bar. Anyway, I, I digress. But, but Trump knows, at least his campaign does, is that strongly religious Christians, evangelical Protestants, and very devout Catholics right now in our country favor the Republican Party. And we did a poll, uh, John Della Volpe, who did a poll for us, and he's done polling for Biden. If you take, if you take the segment the Catholic vote into the most devout, you separate those people out. And these are people who, they go to mass once a week, they do the rosary at least once a month. Elizabeth's nodding her head. She's done work on this too. Uh, they believe in the real presence of the Eucharist. These voters vote Republican and they are strongly for Donald Trump, almost two thirds in our poll. They voted for him last time and they say they're gonna go vote for him again this time. Now the good news for Biden is that's a minority of, Catholic, of the Catholic vote. Uh, the, good the, the bad news for Biden is that those are the most motivated voters. And what the Trump campaign seems to me to be doing that makes sense is they're treating these devout Catholics the same way they treat evangelical Christians. And you and I, John, know there are important differences, but in a binary election where you have a choice between Republican and Democrat, it's not that complicated. And in that sense, Trump is trying to keep those people in his camp. Okay. Uh, let me turn to Kelsey. Uh, People may not know, Kelsey, that the uh, Deseret News is in Utah and has, does a particularly good job focusing on issues of faith and public life. You're also our uh, voice from beyond the Beltway, Salt Lake City. Uh, I was looking at the stories you wrote, and these were two that struck me. Who made the strongest case in the conventions to people of faith, Republicans or Democrats? Mm -hmm. You did reporting on that. And then another story is where do Protestants, Catholics, Muslims, Jews, and Latter-day Saints stand on the presidential race? So uh, you've gotten awards for your religion reporting. We're gonna ask you in three, four minutes to answer who's doing the better job and uh, where do different religious groups stand uh, at this point in the presidential race? Well, thanks so much for having me. I'll start with that second question, just because Elizabeth's data has set it up very well. As she noted, we're not seeing some dramatic change where groups are jumping ship from the Trump campaign or long-term sort of loyal democratic religious voters are shifting gears. We're just seeing very subtle moves at the margins. But because this election is shaping up to be very close, that can be very significant. So there was a great Politico story recently, for example, about Latter-day Saint voters in uh, Nevada and Arizona. And it was saying just a slight difference in their support for Joe Biden could make or break Trump's success in that state. And the same could be said for Catholics in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, for example. And so it does matter to take a look at those slight shifts in support and think about what's driving them. In terms of the appeals, both campaigns are clearly very dedicated to their religious outreach work. And that's particularly notable for the Biden campaign because in 2016, Hillary Clinton just wasn't very active on this front. I was very interested in how the Democratic National Convention talked about faith. Instead of making some sort of uh, direct aggressive appeal, it seemed like they were really playing up the fact that Biden is religious. He's very devout as a Catholic. And they were saying that Joe Biden as a religious person understands the values of religious voters. And it's not just abortion or religious freedom. It's sort of how does faith inform your views on immigration or climate change or the protests that are going on across the country. And so they were trying to say that 
faith shapes sort of everything Joe Biden does. Whereas the next week when we heard the Republicans talking about Trump, there was very little effort made to say this is a religious dude or he understands sort of what it means to sit in a pew every Sunday. It was much more that this man, Donald Trump, is going to defend you either before the Supreme Court or just in everyday policy work. It was much more about those traditional religious topics of abortion rights, uh, religious freedom policy. And so he was saying, I am going to defend you. And I've done this great job over the last four years. And Elizabeth's data about how many people who vote Republican or a leaner Republican are really excited to cast that vote for Donald Trump. That's where it comes from, I think, is that he's truly lived up to his promises over the last four years on issues like religious freedom. Uh, thank you, Kelsey. That's a great way to put it. Joe Biden is saying, this is who I am. And Donald Trump is saying, this is what I've done and I will do. Uh, Jack Jenkins is a national reporter for Religion News Service. He worked at Think Progress. Uh, he's written a wonderful book uh, called American Prophets, The Religious Roots of Progressive Politics and the Ongoing Fight for the Soul of the Country. Uh, he writes uh, extensively, some would say exhaustively, on the role of religion in politics. Uh, I'm going to ask you to talk about the Biden campaign and Kyle to talk about the Trump campaign. What is the Democratic Party doing? What is the Biden campaign doing? Uh, and then if we have time, what are progressives uh, doing around that? But uh, how are the, how is how are the Democrats in the Biden campaign trying to reach uh, voters who take religion seriously? Yeah, so I mean, I, we should know, as Carl you know pointed out at the top, one of the things about the Biden campaign is that you know talking about faith is something that Joe Biden has done throughout his political career. He's not a stranger to this topic, which makes it easier to inculcate it within his campaign. Um, and he launched his campaign with this, you know, kind of slogan, a, a battle for the soul of the nation, um, which is, again, it doubles as a religious reference. Right. So he's been kind of including this as a component of what, um, you know, his his uh, message to voters while running for president, both in the primary and the general. And, you know, it, actually, faith outreach probably played a big role in why he's the nominee to begin with. You know, he was the first candidate to hire a South Carolina specific faith outreach director. Um, back in 2019, by the end of that year, he had the endorsement of 100 faith leaders just in the state of South Carolina. I remember calling pastors um, in South Carolina in the lead up to that uh, primary, asking them, you know, who do you think members of your church are going to vote for? And I was, you know, talking to my primarily um, historically Black Protestants, and they would respond uniformly, despite Biden being, you know, losing um, Iowa, New Hampshire, just, you know, tremendously, they would say, no, I hear a lot of people are going to vote for Joe Biden. And when I went down there to report, I walked into Biden campaign offices in South Carolina and you would see signs that say, um, preachers heart Joe Biden on the wall. So this, you know, when he ended up winning resoundingly among um, black Protestants in that state, you know, I think, you know, there's a reason for a lot of that. Now you transfer to the general election, um, you've seen Biden again kind of double down as a, on, a, on this as you know, part of his political persona and also part of his strategy, right? They hired um, Joshua Dixon to be their you know, faith outreach director. He's an evangelical Christian as well as a former Republican. Um, they've launched a Believers for Biden initiative. You've seen Biden speaking at um, the Progressive National Baptist Convention. And I think all of that kind of led up to um, the Democratic National Convention, which we discussed earlier, which was deeply um, religious in a tr you know, more traditional sense. But I think what was interesting is what they were doing in that convention, which is that it wasn't just talking to uh, members of the Democratic base, although he has done quite a bit of that. It seemed to be overtures to more conservative or moderate um, voters and um, you know religious people. You know, having talking about you know Biden's you know faith as a person, who he is as a person, this conciliatory conciliatory approach to faith, and that seems to be the message that they're going to continue to trumpet between now and election day as a contrast to Trump, who as was noted earlier, is comes off to some as somewhat unchurched. All right. Quick follow up, Jack. Uh, we're the initiative on Catholic social thought. We tend to talk about Catholics. Not so much today. We're going to have a separate session on what's happening with Catholics. But Biden, according to Elizabeth's numbers, Biden is doing a little better among white Catholics and a little worse among Latino Catholics. Uh, what do you think is going on there? 
I, mean, I think these are some trends that Democrats have seen coming for a while. And I think it, it is true that the Trump campaign has been has 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 had no shortage of outreach um, to, uh, to to people of faith and more conservative leaning people of faith. You know, since January, you know, he launched it, Trump launches evangelicals for Trump initiative in Florida um, at a primarily Hispanic evangelical church back in January. And so I think, you know, there has been this push among, you know, both the Republican Party and Trump's can campaign in particular to kind of cast a very specific form of Catholic faith. And it is an open question whether Joe Biden's appeal to this sort of conciliatory Catholicism will be enough to win over, um, you know, like different subsets of the Catholic vote. It's notable that he's a white and Catholic himself. And so he may be able to pull over some votes in the Rust Belt. Whether or not he's going to be able to communicate to more Hispanic Catholics, who again will probably may overwhelmingly support him in general, but as Kelsey noted, we're talking about the margins here, and he might not be doing as much outreach to those communities as he has in the past. Although I will note, he celebrated a feast day specific, um, uh, you know, to Cuban Catholics just this past week. Again, I think that's part of them recognizing this weakness um, that they're trying to work on. Great. Right. Uh, let me turn to Eugene Scott. I think it was about three years ago you left CNN to go to work for the Washington Post, The Fix. You're talking about identity politics in the Trump era. Uh, no lack of uh, raw material. Uh, one of my favorite recent ones is in with the country in turmoil, Trump and Biden's first stops are to their faithful blocks in that they went to their uh, religious communities who are most supportive. Uh, religion is one factor. You cover race, ethnicity, culture, ideology, income. How does faith interact with those other factors in an election that's in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a uh, uprising and national debate on racial injustice, in the middle of economic crisis, your identity politics expert, how does faith interact with other parts of voters' identity? That's a great uh, question, John, and thank you for having me. Uh, as you saw with the data that Elizabeth uh, presented, that's so important. Uh, we can't talk about faith and voting in America without talking about race. Uh, the reality is, uh, you know, our, our faiths or lack of um, are one of our main identities, but they intersect with our other identities. And that's why uh, you very often hear Black Protestants express frustration uh, when news, when headlines talk about what evangelical voters are doing. Uh, because the reality is we know that white evangelicals and black evangelicals, a phrase we don't actually use, but which usually means black Protestants, see the world very differently. Uh, and we know that's also the case with, with white Catholics and Latino Catholics and millennial evangelicals and, and baby boomer evangelicals. And so uh, in writing about identity politics, I, I focus on how our various identities shape our political worldviews and how policies affect us differently based on various identities. Uh, one of the fascinating things when it comes to faith communities and politics um, that goes beyond just faith, but also factors in race, is how uh, the issue of racism in America uh, is processed and how the current administration, or um, not or, but and Joe Biden's campaign are responding to this issue. And so when you think about issues that are really important to faith voters, historically, we've always talked about abortion and marriage and LGBT issues. But when we control uh, the data for people based on their ethnicity, as well as maybe their age, you, you figure, you realize that there are other issues that really do matter to people of faith, such as police reform and, and racial reconciliation. And so I try to tackle those uh, complex topics, usually in 800 words or less. Uh, but um, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to have opportunities like this because we get to talk about them in ways that we always that we don't necessarily get to uh, in the written word. A quick follow up. Uh, we often talk about the Democratic Party's problems with faith, yet we find, usually find Democrats in churches more than Republicans. It's just their black churches, as you point out that uh, among the most religious groups and among the most progressive groups, 
are African American uh, Christians, including African American Catholics. Let me turn back to Carl. Uh, Eugene Scott was, uh, I should point out, a fellow for the Georgetown Institute of Politics and Public Service. I'm aware that you were at the Harvard Institute of Politics. It's actually where I, I met you. Uh, but you have covered the White House forever. I think Abraham Lincoln was your first. Uh, That's right. Uh, uh, actually, 15 years, you've won awards for your coverage. You, you were president of the White House Correspondents Association. Tell us about this White House. What is the Trump administration doing to uh, attract religious voters? Who are their, their targets? What are their tactics? Well, let's start with, with one thing, John, if we can. We've never had a president quite like this president when it came to his own personal faith journey. Um, in 2016, a progressive friend of mine sent me an email saying, and the subject line was, Donald Trump sexually harasses a woman on tape, and it's filmed. And I thought, nah, I guess I probably should see that. I call it up. It wasn't Donald Trump sexually harassing a woman. It was Donald Trump at the Miss World Universe or whatever it was, pageant. And the, there was some banter between him, he, he and the woman who preceded him, and it was is innocent enough. But just to get the full flavor of it, the guy had sent me the clip just before Trump starts speaking. And he said, he was talking about his philosophy of life. And he said, my philosophy of life is if they screw you, screw them harder. He was, and he didn't mean in a sexual context, he meant in a retribution context. And I was struck by that because it's it's genius in a way, it's almost the opposite of the golden rule. It's everything Jesus Christ taught, the opposite in one sentence. And this is a guy at the who said he doesn't forgive his enemies. He said that recently at the national prayer breakfast. Think about that for a minute. So there's a reason that the Democrats are saying Joe Biden's a man of faith. The Republicans aren't quite saying that. But what they are doing is saying this, he's your champion. And so they do, they do a couple of things. First of all, they point out that he chose Mike Pence as his running mate. Um, that's, that's still interesting. They're so different. Um, and then in this cycle, they don't say it quite this way, but he kept Mike Pence as his running mate. There were people who wanted him to dump Pence and pick Nikki Haley or someone like that. There were polls that show that Pence wasn't helping him really. But I think Pence does help him because it, it, it reminds evangelicals, we, we, this guy listens to us. And evangelical, white evangelical Protestants care about a number of issues. Abortion is one, but religious freedom around the world is, is maybe the most important now. Trump appointed a person, an ambassador level person, the first, Sam Brownback's his name, the first appointment like that exactly to, to do religious freedom. Um, he moved that they care, white evangelical Protestants in this country care intensely about Israel. And Trump has been a supporter of Israel and he's made some efforts there and even made some headway there. And among uh, conservative Roman Catholics, uh, they still care about the life issues, all of them, but most especially abortion. And he appointed these um, conservative judges and these, these, these rights to life justices, and he keeps stressing that. And what, what the, the Trump pitched to evangelicals and conservative Catholics, and not just them, there's Muslims for Trump, there's, there's a group, the campaign called Sikhs for Trump, um, People of deep faith, people rooted in their faith community, what their message is to these people is, look, Donald Trump may be biblically illiterate, who cares? He will protect you. He'll protect your rights. And he'll stick up for the things that you care about around the world. And that's their pitch. Thank you. Uh, let me, uh, we have tons of questions. Let me try and combine a few of them. Uh, Carl talked about conservative Catholics and their comfort with Trump because he's concerned about religious freedom and the unborn. There's another group of Catholics called consistent ethic Catholics who feel cross pressure. Uh, they, they care about the humanity of the unborn child. They're deeply committed to racial justice, worry a lot about immigrants. Uh, what do you see going on in the campaign in the middle of those cross pressures? And then secondly, we have lots of religious leaders taking positions. Uh, Franklin Graham, before his troubles, was one of uh, Donald Trump's biggest supporters, said you couldn't vote. We have a Catholic priest on the web saying you can't be a Catholic in the Democrat. Sister Simone and the nuns on the bus 
are saying a, a faithful Catholic shouldn't vote for Donald Trump. Mike Gerson is in this morning's Washington Post saying this is the moral test, whether evangelicals uh, can tolerate the racism. So what about people who don't fall easily into the, the conservative uh, political or the liberal political thing and trying to use their faith to figure out what to do? And secondly, what are the roles of religious leaders in the middle of uh, this election? Anybody want to jump in on those? Uh, let's go with Kelsey and then Jack. As Jack noted earlier, the Biden campaign has been working to appeal to those folks in the middle, um, even more conservative people who were all aboard Trump's campaign in 2016. And so he's been doing that by saying, um, I'm a man of faith. I've been committed to Catholicism my entire political career. Here are these values that matter to me and they matter to you too. But I just wanted to note that something he struggles with and that I've written a bit about, and I believe um, Mike Gerson has just written about in a column as well, is that where he, he might struggle to close the deal with those folks in the middle is that Biden hasn't talked explicitly enough about issues like religious freedom policy and abortion policy. He maybe needs to openly discuss how he would balance um, a push for LGBTQ rights with protections for religious organizations, for example. Right now, it's a lot of language about I trust or I believe in you, faith people of faith. I support you, people of faith, and maybe not enough brass tacks of like, here's how exactly I will create policies that respect you. Uh, Jack, you've been covering this world for a long time. How do you see the role of religious leaders in the campaign? Um, well, I think one of the interesting things about the consistent life ethic conversation is that often conservatives are kind of brushed it aside, knowing that appeals to, you know, um, conversations around the kind of culture war issues, same-sex marriage and abortion in particular, have been often enough to kind of shore up their um, populations. One of the more interesting moments of this campaign or season, however, for me, was when uh, the um, EWTN, this more conservative-leaning Catholic news station, interviewed Donald Trump. Um, and they, it was Raymond Arroyo who interviewed the president, who m moonlights also on Fox News as a Fox News commentator. Um, he straight up asked Trump, he said, there are conversations happening in Catholic and evangelical circles that you're not really the pro-life candidate because Biden opposes the death penalty um, and, you know, as a federal policy, as well as supports climate, you know, action on climate change. You know, what do you, how do you respond to people who say that that's a more consistent life ethic? It's fascinating to me that that question got asked at all, that that was something that EWTN felt that they needed to put out there into the universe to say this is a conversation that has been happening. Again, it's an open question how persuasive it'll be. And it'll. And I know that Trump's response to that was to ignore the climate change part entirely and just double down on his support for um, the death penalty and note that he, his opposition to abortion. Um, and the death penalty is in an interesting point right now because it's actually at one of the record high opposition. You know, there, there's more people opposing the death penalty now than in previous decades in the United States. All that is to say, I do think that conversation that has been presumed as one the conservatives traditionally kind of win when it comes to those more moderate um, or persuadable voters, you know, in the aftermath of the last, you know, three and a half years of the Trump administration, it might not be as clear cut those go around as it has been in past cycles. Um, so I'm really curious about how that shakes out moving forward and how faith leaders in particular talk about it. Well, as Kelsey said, Biden's going to have to be more specific and uh, Trump sometimes is a little awkward. I remember one of the WTN interviews, he said, well, that pro-life is your thing, right? And it seemed to why it might not be his. But uh, let me, a couple questions for Elizabeth. Uh, 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 how many people in your poll? When was it taken? And a uh, question you've heard a thousand times, and it's not really fair because Pew does better than most. How come the polls were wrong last time and why are they going to be right this time? So uh, how do you construct the poll? And some polls have shown some shifts around the margin, as you said. When are you doing your next poll? How do you do it? And what do you say to those who got it wrong? Oh, that is a lot here, John. I'm trying to get me fired or what? Um, so I will say most of the polls that I presented on today are from our American Trends panel. So it's the panel survey that we conduct in-house um, or we have a vendor that conducts it, but it's 
kind of our long our long panel that we have over over 70 waves of now and so we're really able to look at this broad swath of the american public and in one of them i believe the end of july early august poll we have about 11,000 respondents in there which is part of the reason that we're able to really do these deep dives on not only registered voters but within different religious groups you know we're not always able to look at groups like that one of the other surveys that i presented was a telephone poll those tend to be a little bit smaller just because of people responding to them uh, I wish I could tell you what happened in 2016. Uh, there are a lot of theories that people who are more expert than I am in uh, that area can expound upon. I know that our own methodologists have some thoughts on it and we have different posts on our website. Um, but I think even before that, we have tended to shy away from any predictions in terms of what will happen, what the polls will show. We can, because we know that people will tell you one thing and that there is still, especially when they were phone polls, um, that people will tell you one thing and they will vote perhaps differently. And that's that's not uncommon. People are complicated creatures. And that is just the way that people respond to polls and to what they feel in their hearts and minds as they go to the polling places. Um, Great. So all that to say, I wish I could explain 2016. I cannot promise that we will get this right, nor are we trying to get this right. We are merely trying to present all of this data and information to kind of give a broader context to the campaigns at this time. Every political junkie in America gets up in the morning and turns to real clear politics or one of its competitors to see what the real clear politics average uh, poll is. So. I can't ask a polling question without asking you what you think's going on and what does the real clear politics average say about this race? And then I wanna go back to Eugene. Well, John, um, first of all, I wanna say that the polls were not really wrong in 2016 with the exception um, of Wisconsin, that poll was, those polls were off. But the final poll, the best, most comprehensive poll done at the end of it was by YouGov. It had Hillary Clinton winning the popular vote, you know, by between two and three percent. She did that. <laughs> so what we what we forget, even though we know better, is that it's you know it's fifty one election state by state, winner take all, you know, with a couple of exceptions in Maine and Nebraska. But the polls the polls were pretty close. What was off was the analysis and all of the people in my profession and in yours, couldn't get their minds around Donald Trump quick enough. That's really what happened. But you wanna know what the our, the real clear politics poll average shows right now. What it shows right now is Joe Biden with a 7% lead nationally um, over Donald Trump and in the, and leading in every, every battleground state that he needs um, to win in. Um, some of them large, you know, some of them, Minnesota, nearly 9%. Uh, others, you know, Florida, very close, one or two points. So, look, Biden is is winning, and and that that famous poll question that pollsters ask. You know, every poll begins with a lie, and the pollster tells it. If the election were held today, who would you vote for? Well, the voters know it's not held today, but it's going to start being held today because we have early voting, and I, the polls show that Joe Biden's where he wants to be. Uh, he leads nationally. And, and, and I'll say one, one, the only positive news for the Republicans is that it's tightening in the battleground states. That's true. But one thing is that Joe Biden is at 50 percent in our poll and Hillary Clinton never got near 50 percent. So, you know, this is this looks a little different than it did four years ago. Uh, thank you, Eugene. A uh, couple questions, uh, two from people in the audience, one from me. Another word for identity, which is your beat, is character. How does character play in this campaign? Uh, the identity of Trump and Biden. Uh, they're obviously very different people. Uh, we've talked a little bit about their religious identity, but bro more broadly, uh, issues of character. And then uh, Geraldine uh, said, what's at work here? maybe with white Catholics and white evangelicals is less cultural issues like abortion and more issues of race. 
Isn't that what is pushing them uh, towards the Republican Party? And then Franz says that it may be the Democratic Party pushing people away by their lack of tolerance for pro-life perspective and convictions. If they return to a big tent approach, wouldn't they uh, be more welcoming uh, to religious voters? So questions of character and then how does race and how how does the way Democrats and Republicans view religious and pro-white voters interact in this election? I will uh, answer those a bit out of order. Um, number two, for me, it's easiest. I would make the argument uh, based on the data that we see when we look at white evangelicals and uh, Black Protestants and, and even Latino Catholics and how they process this uh, election and issues. Um, uh, that race and ethnicity probably factors more into how they view this political um, uh, situation, discourse perhaps, uh, more than faith. And um, you will see, I believe, white evangelicals and people who are um, uh, perhaps not evangelicals but still white seeing issues related to race pretty similarly. Uh, same going with Black Protestants and people who are Black but not Protestant Christians um, viewing things very similarly. And and for that reason, I think um, it, it is race and ethnicity that is often the primary identity through which people engage politics more so than their faith. Um, in the data that Elizabeth showed earlier, I thought an important number that may be surprising to some people is to see that only 60% of white evangelicals know abortion as a top issue. Um, obviously, that's still the majority, but the way that some white evangelicals speak about the importance of abortion, you would be led to believe that 90 something percent of people are making this decision based off of abortion. And we know that's not true. And that's not new data. We have decades of data showing that many white evangelicals prioritize issues like immigration, national security, and the economy um, very highly and sometimes higher than abortion. And so I would certainly agree that race uh, ends up being uh, the, the more important uh, worldview shaper for many voters engaging politics. Um, secondly, I, I think it's absolutely true that as the Democratic Party uh, has embraced abortion rights further, uh, it has made uh, it much more difficult for uh, Democrats who have more conservative stances on abortion to uh, get in line behind the Democratic nominee. Um, and, and quite frankly, one of the more fascinating examples to watch is to see uh, the, I, for lack of a better word, the evolution, it's perhaps more neutral to say, uh, the change of Joe Biden on his own uh, stances when it comes to abortion um, and his uh, unwillingness to be as vocal in 2020 um, against ab uh, abortion uh, than he was in his previous presidential runs, uh, in part because there appears to be less room uh, on the left for people who do not uh, support abortion rights uh, more broadly. And that has uh, allowed for uh, the GOP to paint the Democratic Party and Democratic uh, officials um, as more hostile to abortion than the data actually supports. Um, but there's, I believe, real fear among some Democratic leaders to even correct uh, the Republican Party and their depiction of them on the abortion issue out of fear that they won't come off as pro-choice as they believe they need to, uh, to continue to win the support of most women and most people on the left. Um, and, uh, and lastly, I would argue that character perhaps is one of the biggest issues on the ballot right now. I mean, when I look back and think about Joe Biden's announcement video, I believe that was March or February 2019, um, his pitch was about character more than anything else. Um, and I think if you talk to a lot of voters about the top issues uh, of the Biden campaign, uh, the number one issue is I'm not Donald Trump. Um, and and that is, that's winsome for him in many ways and it's been quite effective uh, because one of the biggest issues with Donald Trump, even among many of his supporters, quite frankly, has been his character. Great. I invite uh, others to weigh in on the character issue. And then I wanna go back to a question that's been raised a number of times uh, by viewers, and that's the role of religious leaders, uh, uh, either endorsing or opposing candidates. I, I talked about the video that says, 
you can't be a Catholic and a Democrat. Uh, others who say you can't vote for Joe Biden uh, or you must vote against Donald Trump. What is the role of religious leaders? And then if you want to weigh in on the character issue or the question of whether Democrats uh, push away pro-life voters uh, and people have a more conservative cultural out outlook uh, for any of you. Sure. Um, I, I do think one of the interesting things about the role of religious leaders is that obviously faith leaders have played, you know, various kinds of roles throughout American history when it comes to American politics, um, whether that's explicit endorsements or just, you know, standing near a candidate um, or, you know, giving coded sermons to um, congregations. That's that's the thing that's happened in the past. Um, but I do think what's interesting about this year, you know, recording from kind of the Democratic perspective, is that you know the Biden campaign just had 500 odd faith leaders endorse Joe Biden. If you look through that list of names, there aren't a ton of them that you would be surprised that that might be who he, they vote for. But what's interesting is that for many of them, it's the, one of the first times they've stepped out at all to endorse any candidate. Um, and that includes a lot of you know white mainline Christians or more progressive mainline Christians, um, and you know some um, some Catholic leaders, um, as well as uh, some people who you know are endorsing for the first time and representing faiths that don't often get the same kind of attention as say white evangelicals or Catholics do. And I think that's interesting because you know in in a campaign where it really does sound like as we've mentioned several times over the course of this, it might come down to tiny little margins across the country. Um, having those extra little endorsements. And again, there's a whole conversation about whether endorsements matter. But if endorsements lead to like 10, 20, 400, 500 more people um, showing up to vote, that could be enough to tip the scales in some of these states that were only narrowly won by Trump back in 2016. So while I don't think that, um, you know, faith leaders are the key thing that would like, you know, send Joe Biden um, into the White House or send um, Donald Trump back to the White House. I think both of them recognize that they could be one of those series of little things that gets them um, to 270 or, um, um, on election day. Kelsey. I just wanted to make a small note about character. Every time I've written about um, religious groups support for President Donald Trump, I've had people on Twitter or by email or even my own colleagues asking, how the heck are, is this support still there? Hasn't he had enough sort of moral slip ups that it would be away, um, it would be gone by now. And it, I just always bring up again that we're at this very pivotal moment in America on issues like LGBTQ rights and abortion rights. And it matters so much to many more conservative people of faith to have that defender, that supporter in the White House. And so um, I'm sure that many Trump supporters would say, we don't like how he tweets. We don't like his sort of aggressive attitude. We wish his national prayer breakfast address was a little more holy or something like that. But um, we can't sort of at this moment um, risk having someone in the White House that gives too much away to folks that aren't religious or who just don't see faith the same way that we do. Yeah, there might be a less uh, ideological version of that, which is uh, uh, we wonder how a Democratic administration, even one led by Joe Biden, is going to treat people of faith who come to different conclusions, who serve the poor, who shelter the homeless, who care for the sick, and yet their convictions don't line up with the orthodoxy of the Democratic Party. Uh, there's a lot of talk about pluralism in our country. How much pluralism is there uh, uh, in the Democratic Party when it comes to questions like this? We are going to, uh, uh, what, we're 50 days out, and uh, election night apparently is going to be election week. Uh, uh, maybe Kyle can explain how that's going to happen. I figure Secretary of State have only one job, and that's to count the votes. And couldn't we figure out how to do that in a rapid way? But if uh, you're going to be at your computer, at your laptop, you know, uh, at 10 o'clock or 2 o'clock Wednesday morning or a week later, saying this is what happened uh, when it came to faith in the campaign. What are you watching? What are you looking for? What do you think will make the difference when you write that story uh, 50 days from now or 57 days from now? Uh, why don't we start with Carl? Well, yeah, I, 
I think we're going to bring in army cots and a three month supply of uh, paper products and uh, frozen pizzas because this could go a while. I, I covered 2000 and that, that was bad enough. This could be worth what, what I'm going to be, but what I'm looking for, John, in, in all seriousness, um, is, is people, we, we've, we've been talking about how the, the two parties, you know, they don't have, you know, they, they get half of the elephant or a third of the elephant on these issues. Neither political party of our major political parties right now is set up to um, along ideological or even moral lines. We, we don't have we don't have a political philosophy. They say they do, but they don't. But you know what? The U.S. Con- the Catholic bishops they have a philosophy. They're against abortion, capital punishment, euthanasia, and war. Uh, that's a, that's a philosophy. Whatever you think of it, the two parties they're trying to get to fifty one percent. Man, they, they'll they'll take a little here, a little there. And this election is going to turn out why I think the determining factor in the election is going to be undecided voters who are people of faith, who neither party really fits them right now. They, if they had their brothers, they have a third party of rational people in the middle who cared about all these issues in moderation. They don't have that. And I think this election is going to turn on, we say there's small number of swing voters, but in a close election, that's the only people that count. And it's it's in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Florida, and and maybe disproportionately Roman Catholic. How do people who don't align up with either party on these issues, who have a coherent philosophy and think the parties don't, where do they vote in the end? And if uh, if if Eugene's right, and he he didn't say this directly, but he hinted at this. If this comes down to character, um, if people decide, you know what, I'm just going to go for the person I feel most affinity for. I think Biden pulls it out. Um, if they go on, if they if they revert to their tribes, it's a coin flip. Eugene, uh, at the fix, you don't have twenty four hours to thirty six hours to pull together all the strands. As you're sitting there on election night, or whenever your editor is saying, "Push the send button." What are you going to be looking at, and what are you going to be reporting on? Well, I'm really interested in um, the groups that um, historically have backed uh, GOP candidates and specifically Trump, whether or not they actually backed him as strongly uh, in 2020 Um, and and whether or not their pivot has anything to do with their values and their their morals and their faith and their worldview. A quick example of that is in 2018, we saw Republican candidates do Uh, less well with white women than they did in 2016. Um, And a perfect uh, example of that and and the faith and values of white women leading them away from the GOP uh, is the state of Texas. Uh, We saw Beto O'Rourke do really, um, do perform better with uh, white women and white evangelical women uh, than previous democratic candidates in part because uh, white evangelical women, especially younger white evangelical women uh, were viewing uh, the the, ch- the children locked in cages as a moral issue. Um, and they were viewing other issues that they saw coming from uh, the Trump campaign through the, the lens of their faith and their values. And so uh, it'll be really interesting to see um, how many uh, Trump supporters uh, expanded their idea of what matters to God and their values and their faith beyond the traditional topics uh, that we've seen discussed in the past. Thank you. Jack, a lot of people, whenever the election is decided, are going to be uh, looking for you because you've been covering this uh, consistently, particularly from the progressive side. Uh, you, you have been following this day after day after day. The day after the election, uh, when we know what happened, what are you going to be writing about? Well, I think there's a, a few different ways that could go. Um, in terms of what I end up writing about. And, you know, I do think I, I, I second Eugene in that I do think there are several salient issues that that involve religion, but are not exclusively dictated by religion that I think might move a lot of voters one way or another. So I'll probably start today by reading whatever G- Eugene wrote. And then after that, I'm probably going to be looking at, um, for me, I think the, the, uh, the way our electoral college works is that it often comes down to a few states and a very small percentage of people in that state who are persuadable one way or another and turn out among certain groups. And so from a faith and politics perspective, I'm gonna probably really be looking at one, 
turnout among African American Protestants and um, elements of the I mean, parts of the Rust Belt, as well as white Catholics in particular, um, and and white in a certain subset of white evangelicals and white mainliners, and whether or not we're seeing higher turnout or you know shifting votes, um, you know towards a Democratic or back towards a Republican side, because I think those are the communities that I'm seeing, for instance, the Biden campaign appeal to simultaneously, you know, like both, you know, speaking to parts of the Democratic base that have often been the, the bulwark that gets Democrats elected, and also these this small sliver, sliver of persuadable votes who a lot of them happen to be Catholic. So we'll see if, if whether it's Donald Trump or Joe Biden's appeal to John Paul II uh, is more persuasive with that group. Mm-hmm. Kelsey, uh, a lot of our viewers probably don't know, after the election, they ought to be looking to you and the Deseret News because of the terrific job you and your colleagues do covering faith and politics. What are you going to be looking at? What are you going to be writing about uh, when we know what happened? Mine is a pretty basic answer. I just can't wait for Pew Research Center to post those exit poll numbers so that we really see the breakdown of religious voters. I think that the it was so important that the Biden campaign didn't shy away from religious language and religious outreach because that was a temptation of the Democratic Party as the share of religiously unaffiliated um, voters grows within their camp. And so I'm hoping that that religious outreach really pays off so that we don't see we don't see a sort of total um, disregard for faith in future elections among Democratic candidates. Great. Elizabeth, everybody's already said they're going to wait for uh, the Pew analysis. When is your next poll? Uh, we, we should watch for. And how soon after the election will we be able to uh, come to Pew and find out what happened? Well, I'll answer the second one first, because I'm not entirely sure. And I say that because I I love doing the exit poll analysis. I think it's fascinating. And that's one of the things that I'm really looking for is um, who showed up, who turned out to vote and how much is that going to affect the vote? Because we know in terms of religious groups that there are some groups that punch above their weight and some groups that punch below their weight, even if they are strongly one side or the other. Um, The unaffiliated come to mind specifically that they're strongly democratic, but they turn up to vote at lower levels than the share they make up of the population. So things like that, that's what I really want to look for. Um, I'm not entirely sure what exit polls are going to look like this year. Uh, We'd love to be able to do that analysis if it is available. Um, I have, I still am looking into a lot of that as are many of us. Uh, But so yes, I will let everybody here know when, if that is available. Um, In terms of our next polls, we're typically doing uh, one a month or so. They're not all politics. There's a lot of other stuff to be covering right now, but probably in the next couple months or I guess next month or so, we should be able to um, at least, even if it's not a a new poll, kind of look at some of these new breaks. I I will say that as we've been talking about this and talking about how important um, this election is, particularly one of the data points that we have pulled up is that among registered voters, 83% say that it really matters who wins this presidential election compared with 16% who say things will be pretty much the same regardless of who wins. So I will be really interested to see if that share really pushes people out to the polls. Every year they say this is the most important election. This yep. year it might even be true. <laughs> I want to thank you and your colleagues at Pew. I want to thank Anna Misla and Kim Daniels, my colleagues. I want to thank the folks who helped us get on and remind me to unmute myself. Uh, I want to thank especially the audience. As I said, we had more than a thousand people uh, signed up to do more than 1,200. There's a hunger for this kind of conversation. Uh, A little preview of coming attractions. A lot of the questions on my uh, phone were about what Catholics should do. What about pro-life? What about social justice? What does it mean? Uh, That was not the focus of this dialogue. We are going to have a dialogue on that in mid-October. We have a session on September 30th on Faith Latinos and the 220 campaign for young Latino leaders. Uh, Pope Francis, we didn't talk about it, but Pope Francis is uh, signing and releasing a major encyclical about fraternity and solidarity one month before the election. And as soon as that's available, we're going to do a dialogue on that. Uh, 
We have an online salt and light dialogue on October 13th for young leaders, salt and light dialogues under 40 on religion and race, anti-racism in the Catholic Church. Uh, one of the ones I'm most excited about is we're going to do before the election a dialogue on what are the moral and public obligations of winners and losers in politics. Because uh, uh, there's some chance that uh, we could have some problems there. I want to close uh, by thanking our panelists. And there's a lot of talk these days about what's important, first responders, you know, people on the front lines and all that. I want to say a word about journalism. Uh, uh, some of you know my brother David was the media columnist for the New York Times, and he would have been 64 last week. And David and the people that are on this uh, uh, dialogue, it's not just work. It's not just a job, it is a calling. And in religious terms, we would call it a vocation. And I would suggest that in times of crisis like this, the vocation of journalism to tell the truth, to keep us informed, to help us understand what's going on is really important to the common good. And so while we thank lots of people in lots of ways, I wanna thank uh, the panelists who have been with us, Carl, Eugene, Jack, and Kelsey. But I also want you to thank your colleagues for the work you do every day uh, to keep us informed and to help us understand what's going on. Public service is a vocation. Uh, so is journalism. And we're very grateful for the work you do. With that, I'd say thank you to all those who tuned in. And please join us again as we continue to discuss these questions. Thank you very much.